long periods of jabbering. Elephants on horses. I mean, it's all. And then uh, the prophets coming down to Antioch. Um, the prophets and teachers. Now, I don't even know what it means to be prophets and teachers at this time. I mean, how are these people prophets? What do they do that makes them a prophet? I mean, the Old Testament, prophet is a noble name for someone who writes great literature and uh, has visionary experience of an uh, incredibly impressive cult. But I think it is a rather uh, loose use of the term prophet, obviously. But it is being thrown around in this period. But among them, you see, and we did this before, were these odd people. And uh, one of them was this Manan. Manan, and we mentioned him last time, and um, I don't know anyone called in any other context Manan, except later on, perhaps in the uh, in the history of the time, several centuries later, there is a person called Mani, who starts a religion in the tradition of uh, Paul, uh, called Manichaeism in Iraq and Persia, so it may be, uh, I mean, this name may have uh, percolated down, I don't know, it may have been a real name, but Menaean, it looks suspiciously like a garbling of Ananias. You see, Ananias, if you look at the spelling here in English, Ananias should have been there, you see, you know, you say, what do you mean garbling? Well, garbling occurs in oral tradition quite a lot, particularly as you move from one language as we've seen the other. Where is he? We know Ananias was involved with uh, someone like uh, Paul in the conversion of Queen Helen that we already discussed in Adiabene. Uh, Ananias is so prominent in the Agbaris correspondence and the <coughs> Josephus material about uh, Queen Helen. This Menaean and Ananias, uh, frankly, all you have to do is put an A instead of the M and you're really into Ananias. And Greek block letters. Uh, a lot of them look very much alike. Uh, I think that would be an easy thing to happen. Like, for instance, in the scripture, we have Alphaeus. How many remember or are familiar with who Alphaeus is? James, the son of Alphaeus, as one of the apostles, according to at least two of the synoptics. Maybe all three have to look. I think certainly Matthew and Mark. And then you have another name later on, Cleophas. Frankly, I think one just garbles the other because we do know that Cleophas and Mary had four children, James, Simon, Jude, and Josie's according to the Gospel of John. And what's Cleophas or Clopas in the Gospel of John? It's probably Alphaeus in other renderings. Uh, the movement from a kappa to an alpha in Greek. Very similar look, even in English, K and A are I just make this A like this, you know, and fail to get the thing right, I'm into a K. It's that simple to have a confusion of that kind. So, I mean, I know an Ananias, and I miss it, but I don't know him in hand. Where's he go? What's he ever do? What do you mean the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch? That's extremely important, isn't it? Really important. Foster brother means someone who's like, brought up with him, a brother, basically. Herod the Tetrarch was the person who killed John the Baptist. A person close to the person who killed John the Baptist in the family community in Antioch? That really is interesting to me. And, you know, I always feel that because of uh, Paul saying that his kinsman is called Little Herod in Romans, but other actions he, he seems to uh, have like he's protected by Herodians later on, and here he goes and stays in the palace of Agrippa too, and um, Bernicia and Drusilla and so on talk to him familiarly, uh, almost sympathetically, he seemed to save him from uh, harm, all kinds of other things that look to me of uh, a Herodian type. And there is one Saul in the genealogies of uh, the Herodian, monarchy at this time, which is not a common name in this period. Josephus talks about him all the way up to the time of the war against Rome. And he actually leads a riot in Jerusalem after the death of James. Something like the riot after the death of Stephen. We've already drawn some parallels between
between Stephen and James. There's a lot of connections there. But if anyone is the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, don't forget, Paul is in Damascus at some point. Even according to 2 Corinthians. We read you that passage, right? You all remember that? I was let down the wall of, 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 of Damascus in a basket, and I do not lie, he repeats there again, uh, uh, to escape the representatives of Aretas, the king who wanted to uh, arrest me. In Acts, as we showed, it becomes to escape the Jews who want to kill him. And we raise the question, were there two escapes down the walls of Damascus in a basket, or just one? I've told you where you uh, don't have any other evidence to support it, the primary source should take precedence over the secondary source. In this case, the first source is Paul. Where Paul is being pursued by Aretas. Uh, Aretas takes Damascus around this time in this mini war against Herod the Tetrarch. Paul escapes from Damascus because Aretas wants to arrest him. Is Paul in league with Herod the Tetrarch? So there I go back here. Who is the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch? Paul has entree into the ruling classes. He gets letters from the ruling classes to go to Damascus to arrest uh, obstreperous Jews of some kind. His nephew goes in in Acts 22 to the Roman commander's uh, billet and gives information that you know extremist Jews want to kill Paul. We do have evidence in a circuitous way. Now you remember I told you that when we had James, the brother of John, that the same kind of thing could be going on there. There's a brother, and James is the brother of someone, but he's not the brother of John in that reckoning. He's the brother of Jesus in that reckoning. Well, in the Gospels, somehow James, the brother, disappears. And the new James now becomes the brother of John. It's the same kind of um, little, little bits of text around. We have evidence that Paul is related to the Herodian family, and here we have a person in the Antioch community, which is Paul's, who the, who the book of Acts, in a circuitous way, I admit, admits is related to the Herodian family. So my conclusion, it's Paul who was the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, and it's Paul who goes out on missions for Herod the um, Tetrarch. And it's Paul who was involved in some way, and as he says, he killed Christians. He, had, he even, uh, you know, had some Christians, you know, he persecuted the early members of the church and said, even unto death, he says. Well, to my mind, the prominent death is John the Baptist. So to my mind, there is some implication that it's Paul involved in that. I'm very worried about someone who's the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch starting my church. Someone might consider the enemy popping up in the text. Just as I'm worried later on when Paul speaks so congenially with Felix and Drusilla. And we know from Josephus that Felix is the biggest butcher in Palestine. He butchered so many people that there was not enough wood for the crosses, according to Josephus. Do you think that uh, James, given the kind of righteous person he was, would even want to talk to such a person? And that's why I'm doing this. I want to rescue the members of Jesus' family from the oblivion which history and the world have put them in, in favor of the Pauline approach. Well, okay, we're off on our first missionary journey. Line two. Notice, does he get directions from the Jerusalem leadership to do this? No. The Holy Spirit tells him to do this. That's very important, always. Paul says in his letters, uh, from the beginning, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor by men, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He says he gets his, his credentials from Jesus Christ. How can the enemy of Christianity get his credentials from Jesus Christ? The way he said, only the resurrected Christ. Through the resurrection, Paul's claim is he's in touch with a new individual, a supernatural being in heaven, that he refers to as Christ Jesus, that Paul has visions from through the Holy Spirit. The point there is, he is an apostle not appointed by the early church, not from men. And in Corinthians 2, he shows himself to be 
very upset about credentials. The same where we got the letting down from the basket material in the end of this letter. Do we begin again to recommend ourselves to you? And you see the next slide, he'll talk about letters. So we know he's speaking about letters of recommendation. Who are these letters of recommendation from? You must have letters of recommendations from James to be a teacher in the early church as far as the pseudo-Clementine literature is concerned. All the teachers carry written letters of authorization from James the bishop. Paul is very conscious of his inferiority in terms of not having such letters. And I don't think he ever had them. That's why for him, his mission is Holy Spirit oriented. His appointment is from direct from Christ Jesus in heaven. Not on this earth. We all know we never met him in, on this earth. So look, do we recommend ourselves or do we like some? He loves that word some. Remember, who were the some in Galatians? The some who came down from James to Antioch from Jerusalem. And what happened after they came down? The people like Barnabas and Peter stopped keeping fellowship with Paul? Do we need to recommend ourselves? Or like some, do we need letters of recommendation? Or from you to recommend us? Do I need letters from you guys to recommend me to anybody? So there are letters, right? There are letters. And he doesn't have them. Okay. So he goes to Salamis in Cyprus, and he meets Sergius Paulus, and there he has an accomplice a meeting, as we already have seen, with Elimus, the magician. <coughs> Again, another of these magician, magician, because Elimus means magician. In any case, uh, he strikes him dead, and it's Elimus now who is the son of the devil and the enemy of all righteousness. Don't forget, in the Ebionite literature, Paul was the enemy. I think this is a, a version of an encounter with Simon Magus. Anyway, next place he goes, he leaves to Pamphila, and then he goes, uh, this little note is 13.1, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. You see that? How many see that, 13.1? John, who is John? Well, it turns out he's John Mark, the one whose house Peter went to to leave a message for James, the mother of John Mark having been called Mary in an earlier chapter, but he left them. Um, after James makes his judgments in Acts 15, 18 at the Jerusalem Council, and these judgments are taken down in a letter by, by Judas and Silas to Antioch, Paul and Barnabas decide to go on another missionary journey according to 1536. 1537. And Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. But Paul did not agree to take the one who had deserted their work in Pamphylia. So Paul is angry about something John Mark did, right? But that wasn't stated previously, was it? We only get it here. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed off to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and left. Um, do we ever hear what Barnabas and John Mark ever did? Why not? Well, the uh, author's not interested in that. He's only interested in one person only. How Paul got Christianity, how Paul developed Christianity, and what Paul did in his travels. That is the basic story. And of course, John Mark is now joins the list of what? Baddies. He is a deserter. Now, in this book, Paul and Barnabas never do get back together again, do they? In Galatians, is Barnabas angry at Paul? Yeah. What happens when the son from James comes down to, Gal uh, to Antioch? Barnabas stops keeping company with Paul. But you see, the issue is a little bit different. Here, in any case, the issue is an argument over John Mark. What do I think? I think I told you all this already. What I think happened? I think John Mark did return to Jerusalem, or whoever John Mark is supposed to be, did return to Jerusalem and reported on what Paul was doing in these areas that didn't go down well with the Jerusalem assembly, 
which is why we have the Jerusalem Conference in Acts 15, where uh, Paul is called basically to account. Now, according to Galatians, he did, wasn't called to account. According to Galatians, he went up to Jerusalem after 14 years, and this seems to be the parallel episode here, although can't put them in a one-for-one -one correspondence. He went up because of a private vision he had had himself, right? Okay, make it, make me start in chapter 14. Move over and, um, and then maybe I'll move on. That's all I have time for in a short period. What? All right, let's, uh, and then quote scripture, because we've been uh, sent as a light to the Gentiles for the salvation of the end of the earth, I think it's Isaiah 49. Uh, line 50, the Jews stirred up the women and they expelled them and they shook the dust off their feet. So certainly Paul's the hero of this narrative. I mean, the writer here is just totally enamored of Paul and there's nothing that he does that the writer feels is maybe perhaps uh, not marvelous. They go to Iconium and again the Jews just like the Jews uh, went after him when he came down uh, from the walls of Damascus when he himself said it was the Arab the king who did it. And uh, the Jews want to kill him and now they stir up the people against him. So I, I think the picture of Jesus in scripture is perhaps uh, influenced by this somewhat. You'll have to decide. The people who wrote it are of the same mindset. Luke in fact wrote both books. And um, Finally, chapter 50, certain ones, some again, some, some, some from James, some came down from Judea and were teaching your brothers that unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved according to the custom of, Mo, uh, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Basically what they were saying is uh, that uh, if you want the promises of the covenant, you have to come into the covenant. And this caused um, much discussion. discussions. So they decided to send Barnabas and Paul up to Jerusalem to meet the elders. They're called from the sect of the Pharisees. You have to be circumcised and make them keep the law of Moses. That's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way. Keeping the law of Moses is like permeates the scrolls. And Peter makes a speech. When's the last time we saw him? He escaped from prison. And he left a message for James and the brothers. And the guards were killed. Because they let Peter escape and he left the country basically under a death sentence. So we haven't seen him for a while. That was when Paul came up for the family relief uh, mission that we never heard what happened during the family relief mission. And when James was introduced three chapters before. He's back functioning again. I'm not sure we can credit that he's back functioning again. I'm not sure we can credit that this is really Peter speaking here because he seems to be coming and going without any trouble at all in Jerusalem. And the interesting part is that in the Greek, when James, again, unintroduced, but we now, because of our class, know who he is, I think the believer would have a difficult time. Who's this James? The other James has disappeared. Who's this one? But in 914, it says, Simeon related how first God visited the people to take out a nation's, uh, take out a people, people for his name. Your translation probably has Simon, right? Well, you see, it's Simeon. That's what the Greek says. And so, I mean, the translators are making a huge assumption to change Simeon to Simon. Because who might Simeon be in what we've learned in this class? The, see, the writers may not have even known that there was such a person, so they just assumed it's Simon Peter. But it could be Simeon Barcleophus, just as easily as Simon Peter. And in fact, Simeon Barcleophus is the second successor to the leadership of the Jerusalem church. So, I mean, I'm not saying it isn't Peter, but it's not clear uh, why is Peter here if he had to flee under a death sentence, you follow? And notice in Galatians, the parallel material is that Cephas is the person who's spoken of in Galatians. As, and Paul says, I went up as a private vision, remember that? To put before the leadership of Jerusalem the course I had been running for fear I might be running in vain. And there he says, these pillars, John, James the brother of the Lord, and Cephas, 
C-E-P-H-A-S. And later in the letter he speaks about Peter. And Cephas is very close to Cleophas. Simeon bar Cleophas, this is an element in there. I'm not sure if this is historical completely here, the way it's presented in Acts. It doesn't agree with Paul in, the, in the Galatians. Let's assume it's Peter. But I'm just wondering how it could be Peter. And then finally, James speaks. Simeon has told you how God had first looked out in order to take out of the Gentiles a people for his name. Uh, and this agrees with the words of the prophets, <coughs> as it is written. And here's from the prophet Amos 9.11. Uh, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen, and I will build the ruins of it up again, and I will set it up again. This is all from the, uh, Amos. So the men who are left may seek out the Lord, and all the Gentiles on whom my name has been called, saith the Lord, who is doing these things. That is not an actual complete quote from Amos 9-11. That has been changed. The reason why it's so important is this passage appears at the high point of the Dead Sea Scrolls too. On that day I will raise up the tent of David that has fallen, repair its breaches, raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as it was in days of old, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name. And this says, so that the men who are left out may seek out the Lord and the Gentiles on whom my name, that's not what it says at all in, 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 in Amos. I always like to see the context of a certain quote. If you read that Amos, it's very Zionistic, it's about the restoration of the Jews to Palestine, it's about conquering all the nations round about, and it really has nothing to do with the Gentile mission at all. The Damascus document from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, it, it just quotes the first part of it, the rebuilding the tent of David, and it talks about this having to do with the coming of the Messiah and the, re and the resurrection of David's house and it has to do with the new covenant in the land of Damascus. And later on, there is a person called the um, Mibakir, overseer, if you like, of the wilderness camps. He puts punishments on people, he admits people into the camps, into the communities, he makes judgments. And lo and behold, right after this, uh, oh, by the way, all his works are known to God from eternity. That's an actual quote, almost word for word, out of the Damascus document of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then he says, therefore I judge um, it, it concerning the, uh, what we're going to lay on Gentiles here. So uh, James acts just like the Mibba Kerr in, uh, in, the, in the same document which speaks about raising the tent, the fallen tent of David. But they mean that they're going to build up the, the dynasty of David again in the wilderness camps. Among whom there may have been Jews and non-Jews mixed together. I think it, there were two contingents out of the wilderness camp of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, to me, the scrolls help with the book of Acts. And as Acts presents James's ruling, I judge we should not trouble those who are turning to God except to keep themselves from the pollution of the idols, keep away from, which in Hebrew is based on the root be a Nazarite, the Hinnah's there, to stay away from is to keep away, to abstain. From the pollutions of the idols, from fornication, from strangled things, and from blood. I think the only one of those things that Paul ever observes is the uh, fornication one. All the other ones he breaks. And that's the most minimal thing that they're requiring. He laughs at things sacrificed to idols. He heaps abuse on it. Uh, um, and uh, as far as uh, the strangled thing, which is carrion, he says, eat everything in the butcher shop. It's all clean. He says that in Corinthians over and over again. And blood, well, he starts the Holy Communion based on the blood of Christ in the letter to the Corinthians without any uh, hesitation whatsoever. That's what Greek mystery religions did. They consumed the blood of the living and dying God. That was totally forbidden in the Palestinian framework. When he says stay away from the scrolls, the same Damascus document had a horror of blood. That the children were cut off in the wilderness because they consumed blood. 
And did James therefore uh, observe communion with the blood of Christ, even in this, even in this very minimalist approach? I think not. And Paul announces that in Corinthians, from chapter 8, 1 Corinthians. Now as to things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So these people who have knowledge, clearly the leadership who are, who are requiring these things. So therefore, they don't eat things sacrificed to idols because they see the things as an idol. But we don't see the thing as an idol because we don't see idols as anything in the world. Whatever you say, plus or minus here, he's attacking the stricture on not to eat things sacrificed to idols. And those who have laid it down, and he's calling them weaklings. Well, he, he does institute communion in the next chapter 11. This is the, covenant, the new covenant of my blood, and so on, and etc. And uh, so he does jump from things sacrificed to idols into communion, like I told him. So now the question is, do you believe there is a Christ in heaven giving orders to Paul in a supernatural way? That's really what it comes down to, because that's what he said. And uh, my Jesus, my Jesus looks like James. And someone else's Jesus looks like Paul. So basically, you know what the historical Jesus issue I think comes down to? The fight between Paul and James, which is why I am bringing it up in this class. So I think when you solve that to your own satisfaction, you solve the issue of the historical Jesus. Okay, James says, I say, I judge to abstain from the pollutions of the idols. I've just read the Damascus document again with my Dead Sea Scrolls class last night. And over and over again, they talk about pollution of the idols and the community rule. I mean, it is almost like word for word out of this uh, judgment things that you see there. I can't see that one did not uh, know the other. It just is like overwhelming when you look at those things. Okay. So, having read this, they delivered the letter to Antioch and Judas and Silas. They were prophets too, 32. Also encourage the brothers who much who is this Judas Barsabbas? Another Judas. When's the last Barsabbas we heard of? Beginning in the election to replace the twelfth apostle. He was the defeated candidate, Joseph Barsabbas Justice. To my name, these Barsabbas names relate to the family of the of, of the Messiah. What they were, how they relate is another matter. They could be Bar Abba is son of the father. Bar Saba may be slightly different. I think it has to do with bathing in Aramaic and Syriac subbands. The subbands were bathers because to immerse yourself had something to do with the root Saba. Maybe son, uh, son, of, son of the bather or something like that. Bar is son of. So I don't know who they are, but again, they have another, it's another of these family names, like Jesus' brothers, Judas, Simon, Josies, and so on. Now, these fellows take the letter down to Antioch. Remember in Eusebius, the correspondence to Odessa was delivered by Thaddeus and Judas Thomas in that case. Is Judas Thomas the same as Judas Barsabbas? Is Thaddeus in the Apostolists, remember his place is taken by Judas of James in the Gospel of Luke. There's no Thaddeus in the Gospel of Luke. He's only in Matthew and Mark. He's not even in, as far as I remember, John. In Luke, Thaddeus is Judas the brother of James. Is this the same Judas again? I think it is. I think it's a, just another uh, version of this Judas that keeps popping up. Judas Thomas, Judas the twin. Judas the brother of James in the letter of Jude and in the Luke and Gar Apostolus. Uh, Judas Barsabbas. You know, I would scrunch all these guys down. Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch. And then, this thing I read you last time, and Barnabas wanted to take John Mark on the next uh, uh, voyage, but Paul did not agree that they should take the one that had deserted their efforts at Pamphila. So there came a sharp argument between them. 
So Acts is straightforward here. So they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed away to Cyprus. Okay? They, they've, they've fallen out. Now, in Galatians, he falls out with Barnabas over the table fellowship issue. And John Mark, whoever he is, he's supposed to be, I think, the author of the Gospel of Mark. In any case, whoever he is, if he's, that's a real name or not, Mary, the mother of John Mark, we met. That's where you went to leave a message for James. It looks like part of the family again. However that may be, the earlier version, remember, it said that Mark left them and went back to Jerusalem in chapter 13. Here it says they had a sharp argument and they break. So they, that John Mark, when he went back from Jerusalem, he went back to report on Paul. He went back to report on Paul, and that triggered the Jerusalem conference. In other words, he was like a spy, if you like, or someone who, you know, reports a spy. I mean, if I'm doing things with someone else, you're going to go and tell someone else, aren't you? That's just normal. If you're a part of the movement, you're going to go tell the leadership. It's not a spy. He went and told the Jerusalem leadership. They sent the people down to Antioch. Come on up here. We've got to talk about this. So Paul has to get some new companions. So the, uh, he has a certain disciple named Timothy, who's... Uh, Mother was a believing Jewess, but the father was a Greek. And uh, so even though he was not obliged to be circumcised, according to Paul's view, Paul circumcised him because of the Jews. Uh, that also relates up to what Paul says in Galatians, that... After 14 years, chapter 2, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus now with me. I went, according to Revelation, laid before them, uh, to lay before them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, that is, an apocalypse, and a, a vision. I did this privately to those that were thought to be important. I read you this last time, for fear that some, that that's, somehow I might have been running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was forced to be circumcised. So here it's Titus he's talking about. Here it's Timothy. I don't think Titus and Timothy are different people. Titus would be the Roman Latin name. Timothy would be the Greek name. They both serve the same function. Now sometimes, I do admit, uh, in one letter he mentions them both together, but that may not be completely authentic. Anyway, the issue was circumcision with both of them. And they are Paul's uh, problem. In 1610, the we document comes in. Line 1610, we saw the vision. We immediately tried to go to Macedonia. Feeling certain the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to us. So after sailing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothrace. On the next day, we came to Neapolis. It's straightforward. It's the narration is in the we form, something of what you would have had of the pseudo Clementines, the reports uh, that uh, Clement was asked to send to Jerusalem are always in the we form. And th prior to this, Acts has been in the he, they form. And prior to this, it hasn't been always very easy to credit everything. Almost everything in the we document, I think, is credible. And I think everyone says there has been absorbed or inserted here a travel diary from somebody, probably from Luke, which is where Luke got, uh, Luke's name became attached to this book. So, uh, for instance, here, let's see, I want to go up to pick up this uh, last confrontation between Paul and James. Uh, 16, Paul decided to sail past Ephesus so he might not lose time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem by the time of Pentecost. And in 21, we're still on the way back to Jerusalem, and now it's back to the we uh, narrative. It switches back and forth. We torn ourselves away from them, and we sailed. 21:17. You've heard this before, and all the brothers were glad to see us. And uh, on the next day, Paul went in with us to James. Us. And James is the hot shot, you see, again. And all the elders were there, and greeting them, and he told them one by one what God had worked among the Gentiles in their ministry, and they glorified God and said to him, However, 
you see, brothers, we have a problem. You see how many myriads of Jews there are who believe within the Greek, zelotai to nomen, all zealots for the law. Now we know what the zealot movement is. You see, I think in Palestine this movement was the zealot movement. And James is the spiritual leader of the zealot movement. So the scrolls have helped us, because I think the scrolls are what I would call zealot as secret in literature, led by righteous teachers similar to a James type of person. And so you see, they have been told that you teach falling, and this is what the spies have told them, that you teach falling away from Moses, telling all the Jews among the Gentiles not to circumcise their children or to walk in, their, in our ways. Walk in our ways in the Dead Sea Scrolls all the time. It's a euphemism used. Walk in the way of perfection and so on. Well, what, what, what should we do? This is obviously James talking. We've got four men here under a vow, a Nazarite vow, a temporary Nazarite vow. Take these men because you've raised money overseas. You have money. Be purified with them. Pay their expenses. And uh, all may know that things that they have been told about you are not true but that you, yourself, that you regularly walk keeping the law. So what's the issue? They've heard that he does it, that he preaches against the uh, um, circumcision, and uh, we've read his letters, we've looked at Acts. Those are true accusations. Well, Paul's got the answer, doesn't he? What's the answer? I'm a Jew to the Jew, a Greek to the Greek, a lawkeeper to the lawkeeper, a lawbreaker to the lawbreaker. I do whatever I have to do to win. It's in 1 Corinthians. He's not plussed at all. He walks right in there and does it. And that provokes a riot. Now, are the Jews rioting in the temple because of James? No, James is a highly regarded figure. He's in the temple all the time. There's no riots in the temple because of James. He's there for 20 years. When Paul comes in, so on the next day, Paul purified himself, a very obscure thing of the law here, and pay for four others should publicly show that he still encourages the law and keeps it regularly himself, which he doesn't do. So as to declare the fulfilling of the days of the purification of this Nazarite oath. But when the seven days were about to be completed, some Jews from Asia, that is uh, Asia Minor, who know about him, saw him in the temple and stirred up the people, laying hands on him, crying out, Men! Israelites! Help! This is the man who teaches everywhere against the people, against the law, and against this place. And there's a huge riot, and Paul is unceremoniously ejected and only saved by Roman soldiers. Now, to me, that's so accurate. Some people say James set Paul up, that he deliberately sent him into the temple, knowing that this would happen. That's Brandon's thesis in Jesus and the Zealots, SGF Brandon. And the crowd, the reaction of the crowd, that's accurate. These are people who have seen what he's been doing in Asia Minor. Of course they would go mad to see him in the temple. The Acts explained this. Oh, they thought that he was bringing Greeks into the temple. And what well, he was. No, we don't know. He said, even in Galatians, they spy on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the freedom we enjoy in Christ Jesus, meaning they come and look at us when we're undressed. We don't know if these were circumcised or not circumcised. We don't know. That he, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Acts has to explain that he hadn't been doing anything wrong. Okay, we understand that. Acts is on his side. But this is an incredible last episode. This is the last meeting between Paul and James before James' death. Paul is rescued. How is he rescued? Ten contingent of Roman soldiers. Uh, well, well, there's a lot more in Acts to do. The Paul's a meeting with uh, the Agrippa family. So you can do it too. You've been here. Let's look at the aftermath of the uh, of chapter 15. I wanted to run up to the last confrontation in, in chapter 21 last time just to bring it all in so you can get the different confrontations that are certainly here in Acts. No one will, will deny that actually the main thing of Acts are the confrontations between Paul and James. Now nobody who has uh, not read Acts carefully for themselves would either see or believe that, you would agree with me. If you went to your pastor and said, oh, the main things in Acts are the confrontations between Paul and James, I mean, I think they would look at you like you were weird, because no one even thinks of that. And yet, if you carefully look at that, you see that's what, that's what bubbles out here. And therefore, I think Acts is a fair book to some extent, in that it does finally come forth and reveal these things that were at the heart, and that's why I call this Christian origins at the heart of the early church, out of which Christianity emerged. Um, 
James says in this, Acts 15 at the so-called Jerusalem Council, after these things it is written, quote Amos 9.11, I will return and rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David and its ruins and so on and so forth. That the men who are left may seek out the Lord and all the Gentiles on whom my name has been called. Let's look at Amos 9.11 again, just as we did it once, but just to show you that that is a, what we would call, tendentious quotation. Not, not exact and tending in a certain direction. And so, which is not bad, because the that's is close. In that day, I will raise up the tent of David, which is fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old. Hold on, let's see. And rebuild it. Uh, I don't see as in the days of old, you see. And they may possess the remnant of Edom. You see, the remnant of Edom has been transferred. The remnant, well, the men that are left, into Adam, you see. Edom has been transferred into Adam. Man, man. It's a little careful, a little um, sleight of hand, if you like. Make it agree with what they're talking about. And let's see now uh, where this Gentiles comes in. Uh, on all the nations, yeah. I may possess. It doesn't say that, that, um, that, that they may seek out the Lord. It doesn't say that they may seek out uh, the Lord. In fact, in Hebrew, Doresh is to seek. Yaresh is to possess. They've just substituted a Y for a D. And got a new meaning to the whole thing. They've just done some playing around with the, with the biblical verse. Uh, but um, I don't know if you can really say you're quoting biblical script here or a kind of refurbished biblical script to back up a certain position. I'm not blaming James for this. But I'm not sure. I, uh, the very fact that he does talk about restoring the tent of David, I'm very interested in because in two documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this prophecy is, is highlighted. One that's famous Damascus document, which is all about the land of Damascus, which is the book of Acts, is all about that too. And it's a very central part of it. But it has to do with, with the new covenant in the land of Damascus and restoring the tent of David there and uh, all of what the scrolls. So I, I think this links, and it uh, links the scrolls very closely with Acts and James. I do think James is a parallel, if not the righteous teacher in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Can't prove that fact, and I'm going to deny it. But here's another reason to think it. And therefore, I judge, he says, for all his works are known to God from eternity. Line 18 of that presentation. That too is found word for word in the Damascus document. It's not part of the scriptural passage. It's what James. Uh, that's word for word in the Damascus document. So, so what do I think has happened here? I think people have. Um, taken things from other sources, compressed them here into a speech of James. Uh, and taken a, a appalling me meaning here. Now you say, oh well, you see, this is the upshot of the meaning that they have. It is the upshot until you look at, at Galatians. Paul says that he was away for 14 years, didn't go back for 14 years, then he went up to Jerusalem in Galatians for fear that the course he was running and the gospel he was preaching would not be accepted. That is, they didn't know it in Jerusalem that he was going to the Gentiles, nor did they knew, know that he had a new gospel to the Gentiles. Obviously, he was preaching a new Jesus to the Gentiles. The Jerusalem leadership knew nothing of this. He says it himself. And he was worried because they were spying on the freedom, he says, that they enjoy in Christ Jesus, meaning they were looked at a circumcision issue which riles him for the rest of the letter. But these are not people outside the church. These are people in the church. The James part. In any case, he says he didn't come for 14 years and they, and, 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 uh, and they made an agreement. Um, and then somehow, his understanding and Acts' understanding of the agreement is not what Galatians seems to show. Because here, everyone parts kissing cousins in Acts, and James dictates a letter, I judge that, 919. 
We should not trouble those who turn to God from the Gentiles, but to keep only keep themselves away from pollution of the idols or things sacrificed to idols in line 29, as it's repeated again. Blood, uh, fornication, and strangled things. Now, you know, and he writes that in a letter, which these two apostles, Barsabbas, who we've not heard of before, Judas Barsabbas, and Silas, take down to Antioch along with Paul and Barnabas. They obviously don't trust Paul and Barnabas to take this letter down. Have we had an, uh, another letter to, uh, taken down someplace? Yes, in the Eusebius material, on the Agabus material, remember that? Thomas sent Thaddeus down to Edessa with a letter to Agabus that uh, through, through, oh, and they also, Ananias accompanies them, Paul's colleague Ananias. Now, we had a Barsabbas previously. That person was replacement in the election to succeed Judas Iscariot. Now it's Judas, Judas Barsabbas. Is Judas Barsabbas the same as Judas Iscariot? I tend to lump all these Judases together myself. You say, well, what's he still doing here? Because I don't really think Judas Iscariot is a, is a historical character not as he's portrayed, either hanging himself or falling o over in a field of blood with his guts bursting open. I think that the character is Judas, the brother of James. All these characters are really revolve around Judas, the brother of James. James, one Syriac manuscript calls this Judas, the brother of James, Judas the Zealot. And that really is the connection. You have Simon the Zealot, Judas the Zealot, and therefore that easily moves into Judas Iscariot. Remember, there's also in the Gospel of John, if you know your Gospels well, at one point it calls Judas the son of Simon Iscariot. It doesn't even call him Judas Iscariot. But it doesn't say son of, it says of. It always says of. And you're to fill in the son of. In fact, it can just as easily be brother of. Simon Iscariot is a parallel to Simon the Zealot in the Lucan Gospel. Uh, that's why, you know, there's a lot of stuff floating around. So who, let's, let's just tally them all up. Judas Iscariot. Judas of Simon Iscariot. Judas the Zealot. Judas of James. Judas in the Jude letter, the brother of James. Um, Judas Thomas. Thomas. Didymus Thomas. Judas Didymus Thomas. And finally now, Judas Barsabbas, similar to Joseph Barsabbas Justice. But when I get all these names like Joseph Barsabbas Justice and Judas Barsabbas, I think we're dealing somewhere with the family of Jesus. Once again, I don't know, I told you I don't, what I think Barsabbas means. I think Saba in Aramaic or Syriac has to do with bathing. Uh, in any case, Bar is son of... Thaddeus is also, by the way, the brother Judas of James, because Thaddeus in Mark and Matthew is replaced in Luke apostle list by Judas of James. So Thaddeus is one more variation, and I think Thaddeus, as I told you, now you know who Theudas is. It's just a variation on the name Theudas, which to my mind ultimately comes to Thomas Yehudas. Theudas, Thomas, Judas, Theudas. I think it really has to do with Judas the twin again. Thomas is twin in Aramaic. That's how you can make sense out of all these overlaps. So, to my mind, it's just the same story that we have in, in, in Eusebius. Uh, Judas Barsabbas taking the letter. Judas Thomas, Thaddeus. Uh, another member of the family, but there's no proof of that. Anyway, what happens to Judas Barsabbas? Well, like Joseph, Barsabbas' justice, he evaporates. We never hear from him again either. I don't like these characters who evaporate. You should know more about them, and I think the author of Acts knows more about these people. Or maybe he or she does. In any event, James judges, as I told you last time, and throughout the scrolls, the Damascus document in particular, this leader of the camps, which 
gather together in the last column of the of the document at Pentecost is called the inspector or overseer or bishop of the camps, the in Hebrew mibaker. This mibaker judges all the time, makes judgments, judges entrance, speaks all the tongues of man, uh, teaches the law to the many, even to the priests and so on. This judging to me, making judgments, why he says, I judge here. You say, oh, that's what he's doing. I think it, again, reflects the language of the Damascus Bible. Now, we already said that even these things, same thing, sacrificed to idols, blood, strangled, fornication, Paul is unwilling to do. So how do we know? We read you the passages in 1 Corinthians that make it quite clear that if he's not unwilling, he's certainly wiggling out as hard as he can. So even the minimal things he's not willing to do. And Christianity ever after is not willing to do. Does Christianity follow this? No. Why doesn't Christianity follow this? Oh, because Christianity is Pauline. I know, it's hard to realize that, appreciate it. But you say, no, it's from Jesus. Jesus told us all these things. Oh, Jesus of the Gospels tells you all these things. But someone wrote the Gospels. So now, are the Gospels an actual written, tape-recorded message of the time? Or are they written uh, uh, 50, 100 years later and revised to, uh, over the next couple of hundred years till they're finally uh, uh, made holy written in 300 or so A.D.? But then you say, what, all the early Christians, James, his brother, ever got it all wrong? They didn't know what he was talking about? But yeah, that's what the Gospels basically show, that Peter is a stumble bump. He mistakes the Lord's message over and over again. He sinks in the sea for lack of faith. Can't walk on the waters even. Denies the master three times on, on his death night for the cock crows. Peter's like, over and over, even though Peter's our great person because Rome wanted to make a big thing of having had direct inheritance through someone they call Peter. Peter's our great hero in terms of the early history of the church, but he's not a hero in the Gospels because he's not Paulinized yet. And here and actually gets Paul. That's my Christian origins material for you, good or bad. Who knew Jesus better? Paul, the enemy of all Christians, or James, the brother who succeeded him in, in his death as well and followed him his whole life? I can't even imagine anyone coming up with an answer that says a Herodian brought up perhaps with Herod the Tetrarch, involved in the upper classes, who had letters from the high priest to arrest Christians, knew more about Jesus who he was trying to arrest and kill his followers, and he even did some of the followers death, than those who faithfully followed him. Next episode, 36. I don't know what happens to Judas anymore. He disappears. But here's the break between Barnabas and John Mark and Paul and Silas. So Silas has been introduced and he becomes Paul's uh, a traveling companion. Notice in chapter 16 we already covered this. A new character appears, Timothy. We haven't heard about him before. Very Greek, Greco-Roman name. Uh, told you about the parallel between Timothy and Titus. The parallel comes in here, where he says that Timothy didn't have to be circumcised, but because of his Greek to the Greek, lawkeeper to lawkeeper, lawbreaker to lawbreaker, philosophy. Paul is always the practical man. He prefers to circumcise him. He says, or acts says, because he wants to travel with him, even though he didn't have to be. That's exactly what he says in Galatians. I withstood these pillars to their face. Titus did not have to be circumcised, he says. They came in and they spied on the freedom we enjoyed in Christ Jesus. That, um, that's in Galatians 1 to 2. Galatians is the most important letter. Uh, Corinthians 1 is pretty close, if you want to understand early Christian history. So, that's my argument about Timothy and Titus being parallel, if not the same. And they were going through the city and delivering what was decided by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. Says, says 16. 16 uh, Acts now combines the we document with they third person, with the sort of get-along voice. 
Uh, do you think they were really going through the cities proclaiming what was decided in the conference in Jerusalem reading 1 Corinthians? I doubt it. I doubt it seriously. And saw a vision that we should go there. Is he instructed to go there by the church, therefore? No. Some vision again that he has to go across the Hellespont into mainland Europe. Uh, and when he goes across the Hellespont into mainland Europe is where the we voice takes over. And line 10. More adventures in synagogues. 17. And um, look at They're accused of uh, turning the world upside down. Line 6. So these are revolutionary accusations. The Jews are uh, having messengers going everywhere with revolutionary propaganda. Some of it uh, may be pretty aggressive. Chapter 18. After these things, he leaves Athens and goes to Corinth, which is a, becomes a center of his operations, which is why he keeps writing these letters to the Corinthians, 1 and 2. There he meets this Aquila and his wife Priscilla who are historical characters. We know that they're historical characters. In fact, later on, Aquila is very famous in Judaism as having translated the Bible into Aramaic. And it's called the Targum Onkelos. The Targum is translation. Onkelos is the Hebrew word for Aquila. And we, they are presented as quasi-Christians here. And they have left Rome because of a persecution. We do have material that um, Claudius at this time expelled the Jews from Rome, particularly for making some kind of agitation in the uh, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, Suetonius says they were agitating on behalf of one Crestus. So the agitators on behalf of one Crestus, obviously meaning Christ, are expelled from Rome at this time. But they are Jews in the sense that the Romans do not distinguish between Jews and Christians. So whatever a Christian does is blamed on Jews. Interestingly enough, Gallio, line 12, is the governor here. Gallio is an historical documentable figure. But Acts doesn't tell us who he is. He's the brother of the Roman philosopher Seneca, who's very important in Nero's administration, was Nero's tutor and later as Prime Minister, and ultimately executed by Nero for forced to commit suicide. Gallio is his brother. We found an archaeological confirmation that Gallio was here in Corinth at this time, but something about Gallio, prefect of Corinth, or something like that. And it is around the early 50s, around 54, or something like that. But here's a problem. There's an apocryphal correspondence between Paul and Seneca, Gallio's brother, which I tend to credit if Paul is an upper-class person of the kind I think he is. Well, anyway, all the Greeks take Sosthenes, line 17, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio did not care, not even for these things. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul called the God's will to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Sosthenes, the brother to the church of God, which is in Corinth. What? I thought Sosthenes was just the head of the synagogue, just beat before the altar of the governor. In fact, he's Paul's principal traveling companion in Corinth and in the Peloponnesus called Achaia. I think, once again, Acts is slightly shading it over, same as we have two escapes down the basket. So, we're not much. I don't think we can get much out of these episodes here of the traveling around before line, before we start the last trip to Jerusalem. And uh, sailing around the Aegean, Chios, Samos, line 15, Miletus, 16. He sailed past Ephesus so as not to lose time in Asia Minor because he wanted to get to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover and uh, I just told you, the Damascus document said that the people in the camps, under the leadership of them, the high priest commanding the camps and the Mibacher, gathered together every year at Pentecost. But what they gathered together, that was the reunion of the camps in the desert of Damascus, where Paul supposedly spent time. 
that are talked about in the Dead Sea Scrolls, to curse anyone who uh, uh, strayed to the right or the left of the Torah of Moses. The Pentecost here is where the descent of the Holy Spirit makes people into new Christians. In any case, both agree that there's a reunion at Pentecost. I think that is what consolidates the two movements. Paul wants to get to Jerusalem in time to be there. He knows it's important. So now, I want to finish my course, he says, line 26. Here we're really into the we document because it's very matter of fact. Searching out disciples, we stayed seven days. Then they said to Paul, by the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem. There's problems in Jerusalem if he goes there. Not for James and the others. They've been there for 20 years. They're not having any problems in Jerusalem. Only for Paul, clearly for the reasons we've said. Gets to Caesarea. Enters the house, line 8, of someone called Philip the Evangelist. Guess who appears? Our old friend. A prophet named Agabus. This is his new uh, prophecy. This is what the Holy Spirit says. This is what the Jews in Jerusalem are going to do to you. And he takes hold of his girdle and ties it in a knot. They will tie up the man who owns this belt or girdle like this and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. That's the story of Jesus. It's also the story of Paul. Again, we have a Jesus-Paul situation. So, they go up, in any case, to James and the elders. So are we on firm ground by saying James is the leader of the early church? I think we have to agree on that. But Peter, he evaporated long ago. He doesn't even hardly exist in this narrative as we see. In fact, this narrative doesn't even seem to know what he did. James seems to be speaking here. But look, we have a problem. We have all these zealots who are members of the movement. Zealots for the law. And they have been told that you teach falling away from Moses. So therefore, take this vow. But what they want to do is, look, to show that you yourself walk regularly, orderly, keeping the law. Which, of course, we know that he doesn't. We've already been through all this. But look, what is the thing I said in the last column of the Damascus document of Pentecost? They gather together to curse those who do not regularly walk according to keeping the law, who stray to the right or on the left. So this thing that James puts upon Paul here is in agreement with what the scroll community does at Pentecost too. He wants to show there's no truth that you stray from the law. But it's exactly the same thing as we get at the end of the Damascus document in terms of straying to the right or left of the law. And of course that's when this riot occurs. They drag him out, right or wrong, and they slam the door behind him, line 30, another thing we find in the Damascus document. Shut the doors, bolt the doors behind people who are not keeping the law. It says it in column 6 of the Damascus document. Who, who rescues Paul? Centurions and soldiers. And then uh, Paul once again, I think, saves himself by saying, do you beat Romans? People with Roman citizenships. And the chief captain is, uh, is actually taken aback. He says, you know Greek? You're not them for the Egyptian that we some days ago led an uprising line 38 with 4,000 assassins? And look, the word used is Sicario, which is the name of the extreme zealot party. And the Egyptian often is Simon Magus. In any case, the, the Roman soldiers then forced the people in the crowd to let Paul make a speech. So the Roman soldiers are basically on Paul's side. Anyway, he tells his whole story here in chapter 22. Uh, at the end of it, line 27. And the chief captain came up and said, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. Yeah. And they have a little casual conversation about Roman citizenship. Chief Captain said, hey, I bought this citizenship. Paid a lot for it. Paul said, I was born to it. It looks like Paul was warned not to go to Jerusalem, that there were plots stirring against him. We will all agree with that. 
He knows there's trouble there. He knows he's walking into a hornet's nest. But he's not afraid. And it looks like he has already made arrangements. Somebody has sent before him to have the Roman soldiers ready to go down and rescue him. And after that, from now on, he is basically under Roman protection. Then they smuggle him out of the country and send him to uh, Rome. Because if the mobs got a hold of him, he probably wouldn't have survived. So the Romans do save him. The Romans are very careful. He has very, we'll see very cordial relations with very high up Herodians and Romans in the next five chapters of this book. So there's more going on beneath the surface. Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you did. Okay. Um, since we're on a real fast track here, I'm going to just keep plowing through so we get to the end of this material. I think we uh, left off where Paul is uh, sent into the temple by James to show that he regularly observes the law. And uh, we basically know that he doesn't. And as you can see, this is what they were worried about then. Uh, Paul uh, has an agenda whether James is in control at the moment. If you want to get James out of control, get him out of control. Now that's the point. Uh, Acts doesn't tell us how James dies. Though it should tell us how James dies, don't you think? A normal narrative of the early history of the church would tell us how James dies, doesn't it? Well, uh, do you think the authors of Acts knew how James died? Well, I think they must have. They're not ignorant. They're not fools. <coughs> they must have known. So someone made a decision not to include that material. You know, it's possible that in his conversations with these um, people, at the end of Acts, Paul himself lays the seeds for changing the leadership of the movement by getting rid of people like, like uh, James. And then we see here in Acts, in the We document, very cordial relations with the people who ultimately removed James. Agrippa, too, is the person in question, and his sister Bernice. You haven't read your Josephus carefully. But Bernice and Agrippa II are uh, Herodian family members. Uh, Agrippa II is already king, succeeding his father, Agrippa I, somewhat king in name because he shares power with Roman governors like Felix, uh, who marries another sister of his, Drusilla. Bernice, Agrippa I, and Felix, who is a very cruel Roman governor, according to Josephus, and crucified so many people uh, that there was not enough room for the, uh, for the um, uh, wood on the hillsides. At one point, Josephus tells you that about Felix. He was a freed man. He was the brother of this person who was either Nero or Claudius's finance minister. So obviously he'd been sent out to squeeze as much money out of the country as he could squeeze out. Anyway, he also has pretensions because he contracts a marriage into the Herodian royal family with Agrippa II's sister, Drusilla. She'd already been married to someone else. All this is in Joseph. Agrippa I was her father. Drusilla was one of these princesses of this Herodian family. This was connived at, according to Josephus, by a magician called Simon. Now, I don't know how many magicians called Simon there were running around, but I assume this was Simon Magus who was involved in this. So it tells you some things about where Simon Magus stood from an historical perspective, not what we have here in Acts, uh, which is very sketchy as far as Simon Magus goes. Much more information about Simon Magus and the Pseudo-Clementines. The issues are that Simon Magus is in, is in league with the Herodian Roman authorities and is convincing Herodians that it's okay to marry people and divorce, uh, which is the very opposite of what movements like the Dead Sea Scrolls think. Anyway, Paul goes into the temple, Man, Israelites, this is the man, teaches everywhere against our people, against the law, and against this place. We say, oh, he doesn't do that. Oh, in all the speeches Acts records, he does just that. And in his letters, he does worse. And they barred the doors behind him. And the chief captain, as we saw, recognized him. They talk about his citizenship. Okay, in chapter 22, let's see, he tells about his history. He, taught, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the most famous Pharisee fathers. Uh, and then he says he was zealous, again using the 
the zealot language. So the zealots are definitely a part, a part of this. And notice uh, this way, line four, the way in the Dead Sea Scrolls is the name for the moon of the scrolls. So in fact, the way seems to be somewhat uh, involved in the way Paul thinks about it. And notice uh, in line 14, he speaks about Jesus as the righteous one, the just one. And I was standing by and agreeing to his death, and I kept the clothes of those who killed him. Now, I told you that that is wrong. And it shows the authors don't understand things. It is true that the clothes were stripped off someone, but the clothes were stripped off the person stoned, not the stoner. Paul then is let before the Sanhedrin, uh, line 30, chapter 23. Now, this is not the we document. As you see, it swings back and forth in and out. And Ananias hits him in the mouth, uh, supposedly. Yes, Ananias is one of the rich high priests that Josephus talks about in the 50s and 60s. And he's a, a Herodian stooge. You whitewashed wall, line 3. Paul has got a lot of, um, he says that Paul knows that the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees has to do with the resurrection of the dead, line 6. So he throws that item out, so he gets the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin arguing with themselves, according to this portrait. Where does that point about the difference of the Pharisees and the Sadducees has to do with the resurrection, resurrection of the dead come from? Just see this in his description of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In fact, that's the only thing he says about these Sadducees. So I, I would think that the person writing this uh, has gotten his information from Josephus. Because the Pharisees and Sadducees differ about a lot of other things besides the resurrection of the, of the dead. But that's the only point made in Josephus. This presentation, the wise scholars think, shows knowledge of Josephus' works. He says it both in the Jewish War and the Antiquity. But here is an interesting point. At line 12, they put themselves under curse saying, we will neither eat or drink until we have killed Paul. With a curse we have cursed ourselves to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now this makes it look like these zealot Jews, these extremist Jews are on the same side as the people like Ananias, which is not the case. Because when the zealots take over 10 years later, this is about 59. And when they do finally take over, the first thing they do is kill all these high priests like Ananias. What they're doing here, and I think this is accurate now, is taking a temporary Nazarite oath. I think that, in fact, this is where the word Nazarene actually comes from. Nazarene, Nazarene. With the same kind of oath, James sent in Paul into the temple to take, and I think they would want to kill Paul. There's a book, say, um, uh, a version of Josephus, uh, written by the ascribed to the early church father, Hippolytus, but he says there were a group called the Sicarii Essen. Now, Paul is asked if, if he is a Sicarii. He said, what distinguishes the Sicarii Essenes, which are the assassin terrorist Essenes, from the others is that if they hear anyone talking about the law who was not circumcised, they will offer them the choice, circumcision or death. So, who's protecting Paul at this point? The Romans. Do you think the Romans would, would uh, have protected Jesus? Would have protected James? I don't think so. There's a reason they protect Paul. Oh, he's a Roman citizen. I think it goes deeper than that. I think he has contacts. And here's an example. We've never heard of this person, but suddenly Paul's nephew appears out of the blue at line 16. And he gets into the Roman uh, garrison of the citadel in Jerusalem. The Roman administration is not in Jerusalem. It's down in Caesarea where Paul is sent. And he informs the centurion there of this plot. Line 21. Forty men have put themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they have killed him. Eating and drinking is a key thing all through the Gospels about Jesus, the Son of Man, came eating and drinking, opposing those who don't eat or drink. I think they mean by that not to drink strong drink and not to eat meat. That's why the Son of Man is portrayed as a wine-bibber 
likes the company of prostitutes, likes the company of tax collectors, or everything against what these people do. In other words, the Jesus of Scripture is the very opposite always of these people. Anyway, Paul's next. We have a conversation, and he finds out he's a Roman, but he doesn't tell us the nephew's name. Why do you think he doesn't tell us the nephew's name? I think they probably knew who the nephew was. Uh, he's called, I think it says Paul's sister's son. Who's Paul's sister? Why weren't we introduced to her before? Who's her son? I think these are Herodians. And I base that on the point at the end of Romans where he speaks about his kinsman, the littlest Herod, and mentions some other people with Herodian names. Uh, I identify who this, uh, this nephew was and who Paul's sister was in the Herodian genealogies. You can look at the genealogies at the back of James and see. I didn't develop that myself. There's a Greek scholar in London uh, who uh, already told me those things and gave me those identifications. His name was Nikos Kokinos. He's well known at London University. He's written books on Herodian genealogies. And uh, I, that was not an original point of mine to be able to go that far. Well, the Roman chief captain then calls out a guard for Paul to take him to Caesarea. Now, this is not arrest, is it? This is protective custody. Make 200 soldiers ready. 70 horsemen, 100, 200 spearmen. I mean, does this uh, raise your um, issues in your mind? And how does Paul get letters from the high priest in the first place? Who is he at such a young age that he can have such an entree? And who is his nephew that he can just walk into the Roman citadel, talk to the captain, and get this kind of a guard? And how come he stays in Agrippa II's palace when he gets to Caesarea? Line 35. I will hear you fully, and he commanded him to be kept in Herod's palace. Herod's what? Why is he kept in Herod's palace? Why is he put in the Roman dungeon or prison? Uh, you know, uh, Herod would be Agrippa II at this point again, because I think Agrippa II is his kinsman, that's why. But one thing they do say, we find this man, line 5, a perfect 24 pest, moving rebellion among the Jews, and war, uh, of the world, and a ringleader of the uh, heresy or sect called the Nazareans. You look at the Greek, Nazarei on is what it says. Not, not Nazareans, it says Nazareans. Uh, Nazareans has nothing to do with Nazareth, nothing whatever to do with Nazareth. So what that means, I have no idea. I've tried to piece it together for you. In Hebrew, the word can mean to be keepers of, in the sense of keeping the secret of. In any event, um, again, line 14, it's called the way, which we call a heresy. Uh, all this is going on before Felix, the Roman governor. Uh, I don't know where he was introduced. Is Felix introduced here? Yeah. Line uh, 3. Most excellent Felix, we are so grateful to you. We accept your judgment with all thankfulness. All this ob obsequiousness to Felix, who is a brute and a murderer. We know his history from Josephus. Just go look at, uh, in, in, with this idea that they are pests, disease carriers, agrees with um, a letter we recently dug out of the trash pits of Egypt from Claudius to the Jews of Egypt warning them against entertaining in their midst disease carriers who were spreading the bacillus, if you like, of revolution around the Mediterranean world, warning them of accepting such well, agitators in their midst. I think that's a parallel to what we have here, that he's being accused of being a ringleader of this sect of troublemakers. <coughs> And Paul is one of them. And he said, no, 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 I'm not one of these people. And uh, you can read this debate. And when Felix had heard these things, again, the line 18, the, the sum again appeared. And uh, that all, everything had to do with the resurrection of the dead, Paul says, line 21. But that's not what the whole problem is about. Anyway, Hebrew, uh, Felix heard these things, and he put everybody off. He rejects these charges. He's... He, he, he leaves Paul basically at liberty 
But anyway, Felix comes with his wife, Drusilla. That's accurate. His wife is Drusilla by this point, who was a Jewess. The only thing that is not accurate is she wasn't a Jewess. Because Josephus says she left the religion of her forefathers to marry Felix. So the very thing she wasn't is what Acts says she was. But Acts doesn't tell her who she really is, that she's an Herodian princess, does he? See, we know she's an Herodian princess from reading Josephus, but Acts doesn't tell us that. We say, well, yes, but it, what it does tell us is wrong. So uh, he listens to Paul. And he, he, he says he hopes Paul would give him some money. Uh, you know, he often sent for him and talked to him. That sounds like a good cover story why he was always talking to him. I think he was debriefing Paul. I think Paul was telling him about the revolutionary situation in Jerusalem. I think he was telling him uh, about the leadership up there. Uh, look, after two years this went on, he left Paul in bonds. But the next thing you know, Paul is going to Rome. So I would think that uh, Felix went to Rome and prepared the way for Paul to come. Particularly if he was married to an Herodian princess and Paul was an Herodian related to that princess. And Festus comes. It's at Festus' death. Uh, Agrippa II appointed this high priest, Ananus. Ananus, the son of the Ananus, pictured in the Gospels as being involved in the trial of Jesus. His brother, Jonathan, had been assassinated by Sicari in 55. And it's at that point that Josephus tells us who the Sicari are, extreme zealots. I like to think you can group people by their common enemies. That is that um, Ananus, remember all uh, 21, James's main supporters are zealots for the law? That's why he brings James up on a charge of blasphemy when he's appointed uh, by Agrippa II for a short period of time before the new Roman governor appears for having killed his brother. And Josephus says in the Antiquities, as we saw in uh, Eusebius, says the most uh, just of people in the society objected to what he did. So it was a little high priest Herodian cabal that knocked off James. And probably because he went into the temple as pictured in Hegesippus. That would be the only reason for a blasphemy charge. According to the Talmud, blasphemy was pronouncing the forbidden name of God. Now, there was another thing that Josephus talks about. The lower priests who had gotten control of the temple by this point built a wall to stop his view of the sacrifice while he sat in his palace in Jerusalem, reclining and eating with his guests. And then they all go to Rome, and there's a big, huge um, uh, to-do about this wall, and they all appeal to Caesar. I think the James people are the ones who are building the wall against Agrippa, too. All these things, to my mind, is what bring about the removal of James in 62 A.D., after Festus uh, uh, dies suddenly. Well, Paul's been staying in Agrippa's palace for two years, don't, don't forget so look at all this time, chapter 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. This is the biggest segment of the book of Acts. is taken up with conversations with Felix, Drusilla, Agrippa II, and uh, Bernice. Now who is Bernice? Bernice divorced two husbands. And then she was rumored to have been uh, in an illicit sexual relationship with her brother Agrippa II. That's the picture of someone you get, you get here that... She comes in on his arm. She's, she's a total fornicator. Jesus keeps company with harlots and fornicators. The message to some extent is people like Bernice are acceptable. Uh, the message is tax collectors. The Herodians were the Roman tax collectors in Palestine. That's what's meant to be a publican or a tax collector. And the message is these people are acceptable in some way. That's why Jesus is portrayed in that way. Finally, Bernice ended up as Titus's mistress. She was a kind of Cleopatra. All these people, in fact, connived together to destroy the temple. Why do you think the temple was destroyed? Because people like Agrippa too had been barred from it earlier, as you read your Josephus. Bernice, they'd been stoned uh, to keep them away from the temple, even though their, their ancestors had helped refurbish and rebuild it. But this is how the mob treated them. And then, we know that there was a council uh, done, and Bernice was there with Titus. 
Vespasian's son at the time that the Romans stormed Jerusalem. And uh, some sources say a decision was taken to burn the temple. So in any case, Bernice would be one of the most hated people in Palestine. Here she is with her brother on his arms. Paul says to Agrippa, 28, Agrippa says back to Paul, are you trying to persuade me to become a Christian? In a little bit, I might. That is, a little more from you, Paul, and I think I would become a Christian. So these people are almost on the verge, according to this presentation. And Paul says, my prayer to God is that both of you, Bernice and Agrippa too, in a little while, and in full measure, you and all those others, Festus, and everybody else, Felix, will, 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 will someday become what I am. But if you know what, who these people are, what they were doing in Palestine, and how they were looked upon, then you wouldn't think this. And in any case, Agrippa II appointed Ananus as high priest in the time between the two governors. It was 62 A.D. And the only thing Ananus did was bring about the execution of uh, James. And it said that Ananus and Agrippa II had become friends back in Rome in the 50s during that appeal over the temple wall affair, when they had appealed to Rome. So it's all in Josephus there. Well, the rest is, is about Paul's uh, trip to, uh, to Rome. It seems to me he's taken out of the country because he, would have, he couldn't have gone free, could he? If he'd gone free, he wouldn't have survived. <laughs> The only thing that he can do is go to uh, Rome, actually. Uh, now, the question is, what happened to him in Rome? Uh, there's, by the way, the usual shipwreck here in chapter 28. There's always a shipwreck. In the pseudo-Clementines, there's always the shipwreck. Anyway, uh, when he gets to Rome, he thinks that, in fact, uh, he's going to be received badly. He's very worried. When he came to Rome, 28.16, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the commander of the camp. But Paul was allowed to remain by himself. He was given very special treatment. He's basically under a light house arrest, if this is accurate. After three days, he calls together all of the Jews in Rome. He calls together all the Jews in Rome. How can he call together all the Jews in Rome if he's a prisoner? He can't call together all the Jews in Rome unless he's a very favored prisoner, can he? He's an aristocrat. He's upper class. He's got tremendous influence somewhere. I would say Felix and Priscilla have paved the way, and uh, Bernice and uh, Agrippa II have helped. Agrippa II ultimately retires to Rome after he's no longer welcome in Palestine, but not before he split the prisoners from the uh, storming of the Sea of Galilee towns when the Romans sold everyone along the uh, towns there into slavery except the old man and little children who were worth nothing and killed them all. And the uh, slaves were split between Titus and Agrippa II for income. Uh, you can read about it in Josephus. Josephus says that I sent my book to Agrippa II and he read it and he wrote me a nice letter complimenting me. And he actually gave me about 90 some odd letters that he added to my uh, collection of information that he had in his possession to help me, and that's I use these to write the antiquities. It's in Josephus's Vita biography appended to the antiquities, but I think these people helped Paul get to Rome. He spent two whole years in his hired house, and he welcomed all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching the things about the Lord Jesus with all freedom without being hindered. Then what happened? We don't know. But this is 62 AD, and Paul didn't die in 62 AD. Even the church fathers all acknowledge that Paul died somewhere between 66 and 68 AD in the, in the aftermath of the Jewish uprising in Palestine. <coughs> what did he do in the six years between the end here and in 68 AD? And Acts isn't telling you. Does Acts know? Oh, yes, Acts knows. Why doesn't Acts tell us? Because 62 AD, which is what, if you add the years up, Festus came to Palestine in uh, 60 or so, and uh, Paul was sent to Rome at that point, and he's two whole years in Rome, that's 62. Oh, we know what happened in 62 AD. James is stoned in Jerusalem. This scene should have shifted back to Jerusalem, don't you think? And we should have heard about the stoning of James, the leader of the whole church, Jesus' brother. <laughs> we should have heard that. Well, of course, 
No one in the world knows these things. Why? Because Acts is the history book everyone gets. So therefore, no one in the world knows about these points, and when you tell them, they get angry. But if you're a Christian and you care about Christianity, then all these things should interest you. He says elsewhere in his letters that he intended to go to Spain. Where else did he go? I don't want to get into what I think, but he is not dead in 62. And Acts breaks him. That's it. Uh, so there we are. Um, that's the end of Acts. Huh? Uh, I think Paul entered the service of the Roman authorities. As anybody probably would in see this situation if he hadn't already entered the service of the Roman authorities. They didn't. Hey, I think he was already in the service of the Roman authorities because they rescue him at all the key moments and protect him. And uh, he's protected uh, all down the line. And in the pseudo-Clementines, we hear that. Uh, Great inroads are being made in the imperial family. We know that Flavius Clemens, who was executed by Domitian in 96, was a secret Christian. Uh, Epaphroditus, who Paul talks about in, um, in uh, Philippians, was the sponsor, it seems, of Josephus' works, was Nero's secretary for Greek letters. I don't think there were two Epaphroditus's in, in Nero's court at this time. Uh, again, Philippians, interesting letter. Chapter Line 25, yet I thought I needed to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow soldier and fellow work worker. So he talks about him there, and then he talks about him again in chapter 4. Oh, Philippians, line 15, that in the beginning of the gospel when I came to Macedonia, you were so good to me, but later on you turned for some reason. Uh, but look, and I don't need your help. I have more than enough receiving from Epaphroditus the things from you. Uh, I think he says at some point that uh, implies that he's sending Epaphroditus to Rome, to the household of Caesar, line 22. The saints, especially those in the household of Caesar. So there's so there's believers in the household of Caesar. Is what I'm trying to say. So yes, uh, Flavius Clemens, who I think the pseudo Clementines are actually written about. I think that's really Clement. Is an early Christian. He's an aristocrat. He's uh, maybe not Nero's household. He's certainly Vespasian's household. Uh, ultimately, uh, um, he was supposed to succeed Titus, but Domitian, the other brother, you have, here's how it goes here. Vespasian, who's the conqueror of Palestine. Titus, the destroyer of Jerusalem, built the Arch of Titus. These people build the Colosseum with the money they took for the sacking of Jerusalem and the temple and make it into a death palace of games and fun and games of killing and murder. And uh, then we have Domitian, their mad and vicious insane brother. He executes Epaphroditus ultimately. And he also executes um, Flavius Clemens. Flavius says he's a member of the imperial family, like Josephus. And uh, his uh, wife or niece Domitilla, Flavius Domitilla, is also either exiled or executed by Domitian. So what am I saying? There are Christians in the imperial household, Pauline type Christians, I think. And uh, they're almost ready to do a palace coup at, at the time that we're speaking of. Domitian puts this down. I think but Domitian is also responsible for the death of Josephus. Ultimately, Josephus is assassinated by Flavius Domitilla's servant, Stephen. Obviously, in vengeance for what happened to Flavius Clemens. And then the new group comes in who don't know anything about all this stuff. And these are Spanish people. Trajan, Hadrian, all come from Spain. As I told you, I think Paul took a trip to Spain. He says he's going to go to Spain. Does this have anything to do with these people who take over the Roman emperorship after Domitian? I don't know. It's a possibility. It's something to consider. These people all come from Italica in Spain, the regiment that we hear that the Caesarean legionnaire is from, uh, who uh, gets the uh, visit after Peter gets the tablecloth mission. I don't know what to make of all these things, but I don't think Paul died. I think he dies in the general roundup of troublemakers after the outbreak of the war. Also, Nero commits suicide. Uh, Epaphroditus helps him. He apparently holds his sword. 
that Nero runs on and then Domitian executes Epaphroditus 20 years later by saying he dared to raise his hand against an emperor. Not that he cared at all about Nero. So uh, that's the trumped up thing to get rid of Epaphroditus. What, I don't know what's going on here. I'm just telling you something very complex is going on. I think Paul is uh, involved. I think he meets his end in these, in these uh, uh, situation that we have. And I think the book of Acts is written the way we have it to present this kind of Paul. This is the form of Christianity that is adopted into the uh, um, Roman Empire 200 years later in Eusebius' time. Uh, we either have a, a Paul Jesus or a James Jesus, uh, to my mind. And uh, you have to decide where you stand. Well, before you guys go, I just want to let you know that this is probably the last time Dr. Eisenman will ever teach this class. <laughs> so if you could join me and give Oh, no, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. No, I don't want it. No.